All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jason Shade. I'm an attorney up in Johnson City, Tennessee. I've um, been practicing for about 20 years. Uh, my practice primarily uh, focuses on, well, probably about 60, 70% is real property and construction litigation. Of the construction side of it, probably the you know, majority of it's residential uh, construction, representing both owners uh, and uh, contractors. Uh, today's presentation is just a construction contracts primer and looking out in the audience here, I think uh, this is probably going to be well below uh, everybody in the room here. So bear with me. It was uh, premise was supposed to be for the new attorney. So um, a lot of this you guys probably already know, but uh, we're going to wait our way through it uh, this morning. Um, the way I tried to set this up was I uh, went through just a, a garden variety construction contract, tried to pull out some relevant provisions uh, and try to discuss it. I try to put some sample language up there um, that you guys may or may not be able to use in your construction contracts. I, I did not, I probably should have, uh, looking back. I've, I've got a boilerplate construction contract that I use. It's pretty basic if anybody would like a copy, although I, just looking, I don't think anybody needs a copy of it, but you know, feel free to email me and I'm, I'm happy to send that to you as well. Uh, starting off, just obviously the different types of contracts you may have in a construction context, uh, you know, it's not advisable, but uh, I've seen oral contracts come down the pike for the construction of houses. Um, I had a client come into my office uh, that built probably a $700,000 house uh, a couple years ago with no contract whatsoever. Uh, most uh, folks that come in, they'll say they don't have a contract, and I guess my response is, well, you probably did have a contract, it just wasn't written. So, you know, all you really obviously need is offer acceptance consideration and off you go. Um, in that particular case, that gentleman built probably like six, $650,000, $700,000 house. He wasn't a licensed contractor, which compounded the problem. Um, oddly enough, uh, there were really no disputes uh, for workmanship issues. $700,000 house, no, that wasn't the dispute of the lawsuit, it was merely just payment disputes, uh, probably because they didn't have a written contract, among other things. But, um, but again, you can have oral contracts, it's not advisable. I don't see it on a regular basis, but uh, it is uh, possible. Um, written contracts, obviously, is the norm. Uh, you need to be paired by either a contractor or a homeowner. Uh, you know, in my practice, I've seen contracts that, you know, a two-page contract up to, you know, 10, 15, 20-page contracts before. I think, obviously, um, I represent a lot of mom-and-pop contractors, and so if I banged out a 20- or 25-page contract, you know, uh, for the construction of a house, I, you know, they probably would look at me like I'm from another planet. So, I think, you, you know, obviously know your audience. Uh, you know, I've represented folks that are doing, you know, uh, farmers up in Upper East Tennessee that are, you know, are fairly wealthy and, you know, they come in and, you know, you draw up a contract and I had a client tell me one time that, you know, he wanted a contract on a seven-figure deal to be less than three pages and so I just kind of looked at him and I was like, I, <laughs> I don't even know how that's possible but, you know, we, we did our best uh, in that regard. Uh, obviously, it's going to vary between the project as well as the parties to the contract, uh, like I just mentioned. AIA contracts, you guys are obviously promoting with these. They are produced by the American Institute of Architects. Um, the most widely used standard form contracts in the construction industry. Obviously, they're, you know, they're going to get advice from owners, engineers, attorneys, architects, contractors. Most of those documents are fairly even-handed, obviously. They're not going to favor um, one particular party uh, over another. I, you know, for whatever reason, I, I don't see a lot of these in the residential context up in Upper East Tennessee. I, I, do, you, do you guys see a lot in, in the residential context down in the larger cities? I think a lot, you know, the AIA has a form for small projects or residential. Right. That, that's not a bad form. It's, it's much smaller than their a 2 Right. And all that other stuff. Um, and I see... I see some of those, but most builders in our neck of the woods have their own forms that they've stolen from somewhere else. Right, 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 yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and, and to Tim's point, I, I try to, and I don't know there's the exact, I try to go in and pull up a couple form uh, document numbers there that, that may be of, of some benefit uh, to you. Again, I probably in the past five years, I've seen 
to maybe come across my desk on a, on a, uh, on a custom project. Um, so I, I just don't see them a whole lot. Uh, parties to the contract, again, what, what seems to be a very uh, basic concept uh, may not be in actuality as far as uh, when you start you know, preparing the document. Uh, if you're a contractor, I've had contractor clients come in before, say they're going to build a house on a piece of property. You, know, you pull the tax card, you, you know, do some title work, whatever the case may be, and you know, come to find out that the person you're building the house for doesn't even own the property, uh, which, which could be a real issue. This happens a lot. Uh, again, I, I see it a lot more so, you know, out in the counties and whatnot, you know, mom and dad will own 30, 40, 50 acres of property. They're going to carve out two, three, four acres for their son or daughter to build a house. And then, you know, you go look and son or daughter don't even know the property. So you, there may be some backfill work uh, that you may have to do uh, before the construction even starts. Um, if you're an owner, uh, as far as checking out your contractor, I'm not, I don't want to get in Tim's segment is going to talk about licensing, but is your contractor license, obviously, more than $25,000 worth of work it, it is a high-level uh, analysis. Um, you know, I see this a lot, too, as a contractor attempting to operate under another contractor's license. Again, I, that, that's quite uh, prevalent up in Upper East Tennessee if a <coughs> contractor is not licensed. They're going to try to uh, piggyback one of somebody else's. Uh, contractor's license. Um, a lot of times contractors think that they're licensed, or excuse me, if they're incorporated, you know, they're an LLC, they're going to have that on their documents or uh, initial correspondence. You go look them up on the Tennessee Secretary of State and they're nowhere to be found, that, you know, they're probably in partnership or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, if you are requesting insurance documents from the contractor, make sure that the name they're contracting with is obviously what's on the uh, the insurance docs that you're that you're receiving for you know insurance purposes. Um, scope of work. Um, there's a sample provision here, and again, it's very basic. Contractor will furnish all labor, equipment, materials, building permits, uh, transportation, supervision, coordination, communication, shop drawing, storage, work in light manner. Uh, you know, typically, if it's a um, a reno project on a house, I mean, that's probably something you can probably, you know, fill in with two or three lines. More times than not, you're going to see, you know, attach an exhibit as far as what actually the scope of work is. Uh, obviously, it's a short, concise statement summarizing project descriptions. Um, you know, clarity is the key here. I think you want clear expectations between, you know, the owner and contractor uh, as far as, you know, what's going to be built, um, you know, when it's going to be completed, you know, those sorts of things. Um, you know, obviously it's going to lay out the owner's expectations for uh, the completed project as well. Um, you know, it's going to be, again, clarity is the key. This should be a collaborative effort between the owner and the contractor as far as them working together to try to figure out, you know, the best result uh, for the project and how they're going to get from beginning uh, to end. Uh, property boundaries, I, in my contracts, I have a property boundary section. Uh, again, owner will supply contractor with legal description of the property if requested by contractor. Owner will supply contractor with survey boundary stakes by a licensed land surveyor. Again, this is probably not as a huge issue if you're building a spec home in a neighborhood that's already, you know, platted out. Again, up where I practice, you see this a lot where you could have a, you know, a legal description that's three or four pages of meets and bounds uh, description. So I think it's important for the contractor. Um, you know, to get the property description from the owner. If and to the extent there turns out to be some encroachment issue down the line, I think it, it would, uh, that would benefit the contractor in that respect that the owner provided that information. Subdivision requirements. Again, I don't know, you guys may not see this a lot in larger cities, I don't know, but uh, again, going back to the scenario uh, with mom and dad carving out property for, uh, you know, their son or daughter. Um, you know, if you have more than five acres, say you've got a 40 acre tract and you're carving out less than five acres, that's going to need to be approved by the planning commission in your local jurisdiction. Um, and so that may or may not uh, be an issue. And the problem with that is if you start carving out less than five acres, up in Washington County, for example, if it's less than two acres, you're going to have to have 25 foot of road frontage. More than two acres, it's 40 foot. I had this issue come up with a contractor client 
uh, last year, as a matter of fact. Same scenario, mom and dad was giving uh, son some property. Well, come to find out, they plan to use the same access road for the main house. Uh, they couldn't get it through the planning commission because they didn't have the road frontage for you know, the, the two acre uh, carve out that they were trying to do. So again, something to keep in the uh, back of your mind as far as you represent contractors, uh, that this may or may not be an issue if you get out in the more rural areas. Uh, drawings and specifications, again, a sample provision. Uh, this project will be construed uh, according to drawing specifications which have been initialed by the parties and which are hereby made a part of this agreement. Uh, this agreement, drawing specifications are intended to supplement each other. In case of conflict, however, the specifications shall control the drawings and the provisions of the agreement shall control both. Uh, obviously, the drawings and plans. Um, it's a uh, set of scale drawings, obviously, that show the contractors what they are building. The specifications, on the other hand, are a written document that details the materials to be used and how to install it. You know, a very basic example, drawings and plans may have a vanity with one sink, whereas specifications, you know, may have a vanity with two sinks. Well, in that particular case, if, you know, the specifications will control. Um, so I, I think it's important to put some clarification language in there as far as what's going to control uh, if conflicts do arise. Uh, between, uh, you know, those particular types of uh, documents. Uh, um, time for completion of work. I, I think, you know, as we go through uh, some of these provisions today, uh, some of these are more fertile for litigation than others. Obviously, time completion for work is one of them. Change orders is probably another. Um, you know, as far as the contracts you provide for completion by a certain date or within a certain period of time, again, legal issues obviously come up. It's fertile ground for litigation. Um, you know, I think if you're looking at preferences between uh, an owner uh, and a, uh, a contractor, you know, the owner is going to want a, a set period of time for their, for their house to be completed, obviously. Uh, you know, most construction loans are 12 months, typically. Uh, and so the owner is going to want their house to be completed within that 12 month period. Uh, obviously, you know, on those construction loans, uh, you know, you've got interest only a lot of times for that 12 month period on the construction draw. If it's not extended, the bank is not gracious enough to extend it past that 12 month period, uh, then that's going to convert to a conventional P&I payment. Um, and so, which if you have an owner that's building a custom and they're barely able to build the you know, $750,000 dream home, and all of a sudden that's converting over to a P&I payment, um, and they're still living someplace else and haven't sold that other, whatever the case may be, it, it can uh, create uh, some issues for sure. Um, owner's gonna want to ensure that there's some language in there that, uh, you know, that, that the completion time's not gonna be extended for malfeasance or some sort of negligence, if you will, on the part of the, uh, of the contractor. Uh, you know, situations can arise, you know, if a contractor, um, you know, needs that they're going to need a piece of equipment or certain materials to complete the job and they're just, you know, negligent and failing to order it within a particular period of time, where obviously the owner is going to want some uh, language in there to protect themselves on that. On the other hand, owners should have a realistic completion of the time schedule. Obviously, projects are going to move along a lot faster, or they should, uh, spring, summer, fall months, and they will the winter months for obvious reasons. Uh, contractor preferences. I don't know of any contractor, at least mine, <laughs> that want a, a set time frame within which to complete a project. Um, you know, if and to the extent the, you know, this is a issue of, of deep conflict between the owner and contractor, obviously, and there probably should always be a situation where, uh, you know, the contractor is going to put some language in there that's going to give them an out, you know, for, you know, acts of God, you know, labor shortages, material shortages, uh, you know, whatever the case may be that they, they have an out, if and to the extent um, it's not, uh, the project's not completed within a particular period of time. Um, Obviously, the contractor is going to want, you know, some language in there, too, that, uh, you know, if the contract isn't completed, and that's on the fault of the owner, that there's some language in there that protects the, the contractor uh, on that front as well. Um, you know, if you've got an inexperienced contractor and they just don't really know, you know, 
how long it may take to, to build this particular type, of excuse me, particular type of structure or house or whatever the case may be. You know, have them talk with a more experienced contractor. I've done that before, um, just so we can uh, you know wade through those issues as far as completion times and the like. Uh, how do you define uh, completion? Um, you know, no. <laughs> Another fertile ground for litigation. Obviously, uh, you know, it's probably completed for its, you know, it can be used for its intended purpose. Um, you know, in the residential sense, that could be the, the CEO certificate of occupancy. You know, maybe, maybe not uh, in, in construction, or excuse me, commercial projects. Um, you know, I, you know, I, Jerry talked a little bit about this. I mean, you know, if you've got a owner that's building a hotel and the interior rooms are finished, and they can actually, you know, uh, allow folks in to sleep overnight. You know, that, that's the intended purpose. That's what a hotel is. But that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if the landscaping's fit, you know, not finished, the lobby's not finished, the restaurant's not finished, uh, that it's actually substantially completed. So, again, that's, that's another um, fertile ground for uh, uh, litigation as well. Uh, if and to the extent, you know, there's a contract that has a time extension provision, um, and this not just construction contracts, but just contracts in general. Make sure your client's just following, you know, what they need to do. If they need to provide notice by certified mail by X amount of time, you know, or a certain date, then have them do it. Uh, you know, I hate, although it's becoming more prevalent, I hate having email notice provisions and contracts. I, I think it's, you know, for obvious reasons. I don't, you know, I. One, a lot of people don't read emails, you know, they should, but, you know, we get inundated with them on a daily basis. And two, a lot of, you know, I'll, I'll get 25 emails a day about investing in some African scam and trying to give people money, but emails from clients somehow end up in my spam folder. So I haven't really, you know, quite figured that out. But, you know, again, as far as the time extensions and the notice, uh, make sure your clients are just, per, you know, uh, following through, doing what they're supposed to do on the notice provisions in a particular agreement. A very basic provision here, um, you know, this is just one I pulled out, you know, that uh, after the execution of the agreement, it will have the job site ready for commencement of construction and shall give the contractor written notice to commence work. Contractor shall commence work within so many days after such notice and shall complete the work within so many calendar days. Obviously, we probably can read that one paragraph and see, you know, 25 different issues that can come up with that. But, you know, again, you know, it, it's a place to start uh, as far as, you know, at least having some sort of timeline when things are going to uh, get started and completed. The companion clause that I was talking about earlier, if there is a fixed um, time frame in a contract, uh, which, again, con uh, most contractors don't like, uh, this companion clause, again, um, is something that, that can be inserted, and there's probably additional language as well, but, you know, the contractor will be excused for delay and completion for acts of God, acts of the owner, inclement weather, labor trouble, acts of public agencies, inspectors, public utilities, extra work, failure of the owner to make progress payments promptly, your other contingencies unforeseen by the contractor and beyond the reasonable control of the contractor. Again, it's one of those scenarios where you want to allow the contractor an opportunity to at least have an out if you know, the house, for example, the million dollar home that he's building is not completed within um, a particular period of time. Uh, payment on the project, there's obviously many different variations for this. Um, I tried to go through and um, just pick out two that I see frequently, um, and it's obviously the cost plus contract and the fixed price contract. Uh, you know, the cost plus is basically, you know, it's going to be the cost of the project plus, you know, the profit uh, margin. Um, you know, typically the profit margin is going to be, at least that I see, 10, 15, 20 percent. So the cost uh, is going to be the material labor overhead. The contractor is going to know ahead of time. They're going to factor all that in. It's going to be the cost. And then, you know, the extra 10, 15, 20 percent is going to be, um, you know, their profit. Um, obviously, if you've got an unlicensed contractor, again, that, that could cause some issues about what they can actually recover, um, you know, if they are unlicensed as well. Um, 
Fixed price, obviously it, it's what it says. The, you know, the contract is going to uh, be, or excuse me, the project's gonna be constructed for a, a fixed price. Uh, you know, there, there's pros and cons to both of those. Um, obviously, I think uh, in the residential sense, I think a homeowner is going to want a fixed price contract, obviously. I mean, it's, they know what they're getting for a, a, a set amount of money. Um, I've had some contractor clients recently tell me that they're just not building custom homes anymore, uh, especially with the margins that they've had the past couple years. Um, and, and the profit that they're making, they can go in, they know on a spec house, um, they'll go in and buy five lots in the neighborhood, they'll come in and, you know, you know, put the footers down, you know, the framing crew will come in, you know, um, you know, and just, they'll just go right down the line and, and construct, you know, five houses. Uh, they'll do it for a set price for each house. They know ahead of time what their uh, what their margins are, um, you know, what the, what the fixed price is. They, they know from experience that they're going to make a certain amount of money uh, on each project. Um, so, again, I, I think a lot of contractors these days would, you know, don't mind fixed, uh, fixed price contracts. I mean, you still get any issues with change orders and the like, but, you know, for the most part, uh, again, there's a lot up in my neck of the woods that aren't even doing custom homes anymore. They just don't make the money that they will on a fixed price spec home. Uh, you know, cost plus, obviously, you know, um, you know, it's, there's not a downside to that if you're a, a contractor. I mean, the project is what it is. Um, so, you know, back in the day, I think, you know, you used to see a lot of contractors using cost plus contracts, and, and they still are, especially on the customs that they're doing. Um, a lot of times that may not be a, a bad deal for the uh, homeowner as well. I mean, obviously, you know, if you get a fixed price contract, you know, the contractor may put lower grade materials, finishings in the house uh, for the fixed price to increase its profit margin. If you're doing a cost plus scenario, obviously you can control the finishes and, and you know, the detail that you're putting in the house. And if you've got a client that's, you know, building a million dollar plus home, then they know they're already spending a ton on a house. So um, they, they may not mind the, the cost plus. Um, you know, scenario. So, obviously, cost plus contracts can face disputes over price calculations. See that all the time. Uh, payment for the project. Um, general considerations here is just be consistent. And, I, you know, I was preparing this presentation. I had a, just about two weeks ago, uh, I had a client come in, moved here from California, bought a farmhouse. They're renovating it, hired a contractor who oddly enough, wasn't licensed as well. Uh, but uh, in this particular scenario, um, you know, the, the, the contract that this contractor was using, it may have been one pulled off the internet, I'm not sure, it was fairly detailed, but he went through every stage of, you know, the master bedroom, you know, bam, this is what I'm doing, you know, master bathroom, this is what I'm doing. Well, after every, after every one, he put estimated cost for work described, and this was the last one that is cut and paste. It was 12,460. Well, if you come down here, you can see the contract price that he has. The owner will pay the company the fixed sum of 102,363. So, I mean, obviously, are you dealing with a cost plus scenario or, you know, a fixed price contract? Obviously, I'm representing the owner in that situation, so I'm going to argue it's a fixed price, but. Uh, Again, you know, just, just be consistent, you know, in the terms that you're using uh, in your contracts, uh, because obviously if there's an ambiguity like this, it can create, um, you know, some issues. In this particular case, uh, they did amend it. A job actually went up to 120, but project went over to 150. My client asked, you know, how much more work? Contractor said about $10,000 worth more of work. Come to find out, they got popped with a final bill of about fifty thousand dollars. So, a hundred twenty thousand dollar contract ended up being a two hundred thousand dollar job, uh, which my clients are not too terribly excited about at this point. So, um, oh, they're excited. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not excited to pay it, but yes, their their blood pressure is is elevated for sure. <laughs> so, good point. Um, you know, again, estimates. I've had some a couple cases with these estimates, even on cost plus contracts. You know, can lead to litigation, and I think you have to be careful if you're representing a contractor. 
you know, how to protect the contractor in this regard. Um, I don't know, you guys may have seen a lot of this too, but it's a situation where it's a cost plus contract. You know, contractor's gonna say, ah, you know, it's gonna, you know, $150,000, $200,000, whatever the case may be. Well, it gets in and it's, you know, a, a lot more for a, a lot of different reasons. Could be change orders, it could be just the contractors, you know, ripping the owner off. I mean, it's hard to tell. Uh, one thing I've, you know, I'm not saying it's bulletproof. Uh, I've started to try to use some language. Um, and there's probably different variations you can put in there, but, you know, you know, if there's an estimate, I'll, you know, I've been trying to put some language in. The scope of work shall consist of the categories of work described on the estimate attached here too. The estimate is attached solely for the purpose of describing the category of the work. The pricing on the estimate shall have no bearing on the cost of the work. You know, I, I made the point now where I'm, I'm putting that in bold, you know, like a liquidated damages provision. I'm putting a little underline there and making, you know, the owner uh, sign it at least to give my contractor clients some uh, some protection, you know, if and to the extent it is a cost plus estimates are involved, you know, that you can fall back on uh, that at a later date. Uh, yes, sir. I have a situation where the cost, well, it's just like what you showed. Mm -hmm. It has both in this contract, cost plus and a fixed cost. Yeah. So, you know, what kind of contract would have? But also, the contractor said he was billing a flat amount every month of like twelve hundred dollars because for what he line item as uh, the job foreman for him mm -hmm. being the job foreman and he said well I didn't hire a job foreman but I was performing that duty mm -hmm. and he put twelve or fifteen hundred each month and I'm like wait a minute no but he wasn't on the job every day yeah yeah and uh, I don't know. I, the decision I took is no. You don't get that's double dipping, basically. Is what I yeah, and I, I think I think most at least the judges I practice for probably would would say the same thing. Um, I, I just don't think that, you know that is would be considered double double dipping, and you know, in my opinion, as far as that goes. So um, I, I think that goes into and and it's a problem because there's really while there are certain items that. <laughs> most contractors and most construction organizations like ABC and AGC would agree are part of overhead. There's no real definition yeah. in yeah. the world. And so every contractor kind of has their own version of what they capture as overhead. And frankly, a lot of that time, a lot of that looks like stuff that might ought to be profit, that might ought to be something else. That's, that's a tough, that's yeah. a tough issue on a lot of people. It is, it is. See it a lot. Uh, it comes up, uh, you know, again, it's another fertile ground for elimination is, uh, litigation, excuse me, as far as, you know, the pricing of the contract and, and what it may be. I, I don't know if there's really, uh, you know, uh, it's a very fact specific analysis. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that you kind of get into and, you know, I think every situation is going to be different and I think you know every situa situation will be different um, and you just got to wade, wade your way through it as far as the arguments and you know trying to to get it resolved. I, those those types of arguments come up obviously are discussed a lot at mediation it always seems up they kind of you know again I don't think a judge would allow that in, during your situation but there's always there always seems to be a, a workout in mediation I've always encountered as far as how much you know their contractors going to be paid for stuff like that out of mediation probably five years ago where that was the case um, you know it was a cost plus and you know the hours worked the, the contractor was working and some other things was at issue and so I mean obviously ended up just settling for you know probably somewhere in the middle but um, I, you know I, I don't think a judge would allow it uh, I can't say always but um, Again, I think it's something that can be worked out through mediation a lot of times. Well, in support of your view with that provision, mm -hmm. there's at least one Tennessee case that I have cited probably mm -hmm. more than I should, but the quote in the case is, an estimate is just that, right. an estimate. Right. And that's a great quote mm -hmm. because it's, it's an acknowledgement that like when I have contractor clients, I always tell them, don't ever say this is the budget. 
don't ever say that you, this is some say it's an estimate because at least you've got the argument. Hey, that was our best guess. When we right. 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 So I've, I've ran into this issue several times. I was wondering if it was litigated it all the way through, or at least how we were supposed to deal with it. On is it just an estimate, and at what point does it become what well, looks like they they purposely lowballed this person to get them to sign the contract, mm -hmm. and then now you're looking at 70, 80 percent over what it was done. And we we're talking a let's say a residential client. Mm -hmm. And, and not Volkswagen, they don't have these unlimited bank resources to come in and say, okay, we can pay that because this price has increased. And I'm not talking about due to material increases or anything like that, but literally it just was way more expensive than what was estimated. And was to the point where it really looks like there's some sort of negligence. And the mm -hmm. only cases I've seen that deal with that are really more in um, property sales. Mm -hmm. So if you were to say, well, I'm selling you this three acre lot, turns out it's a really a one and a half acre lot. Now, you can get into all the who and mm -hmm. why that happened, but there are, there's a court case out there that says, well, you're talking, once you get to 50%, it's kind of presumptive that that looks like fraud mm -hmm. or misrepresentation. But I, I don't know if you've dealt with that in this estimate issue, because it comes up a lot. I haven't, you know, personally, I was trying to think, I know my partner, uh, we had a situation uh, and I wasn't really involved and I can't speak in great detail on it, but that, that situation did come up. It ended up settling and we had a contractor client that come in, I, I do know that was owed probably you know, 10, $15,000, you know, it's one of those things, a lot of times you, you sometimes you just tell your clients just to walk away because you know it's gonna kick up a hornet's nest. Well, sure enough, you wanted to file suit to collect, you know, the extra 15, $20,000, whatever it was. And, uh, you know, they responded and counterclaimed. And a lot of it was based upon what you just mentioned. It was, you know, the, he was, you know, given some estimates and uh, it ended up being, you know, $75,000 more than what, you know, uh, for the house renovation. And he actually, uh, I think he actually, well, he ended up paying some money to settle that case because some things came out in depositions that, uh, kind of shed some light on, on some of the things that he was doing. So I've never tried that, um, you know, all the way through. I, you know, I don't know how a judge, that one, one thing I was telling you about, the other one where I cut and pasted the, uh, the, the you know, the, the cost, the, the fixed sums and the estimates, he was actually not a licensed contractor. I know Tim will probably get into this and that, you know, our defense was gonna be, a lot of that was his profit overhead and what he can recover is being an unlicensed contractor. So that's probably gonna be uh, the, the major defense in that case, along with some of the ambiguities. I think somebody else had their hand up. Yeah, I've tried that a couple of times. Yeah. And uh, I do, with that fellow said over there, yeah. I, I, I want them to use my adjectives. And they'll start off using his. Yeah. But we get into that deposition and that trial long enough. Yeah, I yeah. My adjectives long enough, they start using mine because they're the real ones. Yeah, and this yeah, is the contract yeah. price. Yeah. And then we start talking about operating pursuant to that contract price for the categories of work. Yeah. And then you've got this budget of twelve thousand yeah. dollars. You got yeah. your materials and your men yeah. and all that stuff. And so they start talking about how they're having trouble sticking to the contract price and for this category of work. So then, like, you know, after they spend long enough right. all right. the, con the, the contract price and trying to st and showing actions that reflect that being a contract price, and the judge has no problem. Uh, holding them to that because mm -hmm. these guys are drafting the contracts, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I, to me, the worst thing or the best thing, depending on what side you're on, that's happened recently for us is the Blue Cross Blue Shield case where the Tennessee Supreme Court gave us this gigantic, mm -hmm. you know, law review article on what, what do we look at to determine what's in a contract, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they go, 30 pages on that and you know the cliff's notes is on the one side is it the four corners what you call the content or is it what they were talking about what they understood the context and so they go you know if you've read the if you, if you can stay awake long enough you've read the opinion and you go through this whole thing and then they get to the end of the opinion and say well you know Tennessee's never really been all content or all context you know, it's kind of a little of both. <laughs> and so it's like on any of those arguments, that's kind of where you are now. And I, I sure wish the court would have given us a little bit 
Mm -hmm. I don't want to criticize the court, but a, a better guidance because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's hanging over all of these mm -hmm. issues now. Yeah. You know, just makes me think, because I never pass up an opportunity to attack the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> but this presumption, the court's presumption that the legislature knew what they were doing <laughs> when they wrote this. <laughs> or knew the law. Yeah. 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 They're presumed to have known the law. Oh, yeah? <laughs> when we know in reality, it's a, it's a lobbyist sticking something under somebody's nose. Mm -hmm. Here, put this in. And that's what's great. Any of you ever been down at the sausage factory, which is the state capital? <laughs> and if they're trying to get out of town, they haven't passed a budget yet. And that's when the lobbyists are down there sneaking in these little amendments to bills. No, it don't start. They don't start on caption bills versus oh, yeah. the real bills. Most of the folks in here, I think, they tend to be too. Yeah. He had a saying, well, the high school assistant for the legislature was out that day. <laughs> 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 or they say they, they put the inmates in charge of the asylum. Mm. Uh, payment, again, just a couple of the things on payments for project here. Uh, you know, if you represent an owner, you may want the payments, you know, structured in accordance with, you know, their construction loan documents. Obviously, every bank is going to be different. Um, there's some sample language here. That's obviously probably more for a fixed price type of scenario, um, and probably is more slanted towards uh, you know a, a contractor. Um, you know, I have a case going on right now. It's kind of interesting, and I mean, there's a lot going on with it. But I just got involved. But you know, for whatever reason, you know, draws were made on this particular lake house, uh, and uh, about 90% of the draws uh, have been taken for what was, you know, reported to be the, the contract price, and about only 50% of the house is completed. And so you guys probably see that a lot too. I, you know, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, somebody from the bank not going out and doing their job. It's probably, you know, a, a little bit of everything, probably some contractor misapplication of funds. That comes up quite a bit uh, as well. So uh, obviously, you know, if it to the extent, you know, you can get your, the, you know, the contractor to also control, or excuse me, the client owner to also control when those draws are going to be issued, uh, you know, that would be of a benefit to the owner client as well. Home improvement contractors, uh, I see this a lot, uh, not, uh, you know, a lot of times, and I've had some clients that come in and wanted to do this, they'll come in and they'll want to do a, you know, a, you know, $60,000 reno project on the house and they're going to, you know, want 40 or 50% of the money up front. Uh, and there's actually a contractor up in uh, uh, my neck of the woods that was doing a lot of this, and you know he's being prosecuted by uh, federal authorities and all that right now. But um, but you're only allowed to take one third uh, up front on a uh, on a home project. Um, there is an exception to that. You know if there's a you know payment performance bond, you know they've got a bond that's you know again one percent of the net sales of the home improvement contractor's home improvement business. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, I've had some, again, some contractor clients come in and want to take more than one third, and we kind of we kind of back that out uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, change orders, um, you know, we're going to pretty you know hit this at a high level. Again, this is probably a, a topic that we could probably spend a day on as well. Um, you know, uh, you know, there probably should be some language uh, in your agreement that kind of talks about change orders in some form or fashion. A lot of times it's going to say that, you know, a change order is only valid if it's in writing, signed by both parties, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, change order is going to, um, you know, make an adjustment to the original contract, and, you know, in the residential setting come in many, you know, shapes and forms as far as what's being amended or changed. Um, you know, obviously the change order should include, you know, project and, uh, you know, contact information. You know, you may have an owner that may have multiple projects going on, you know, it's hard to say. So make sure that your change order includes that, the day of the change, details of the change, obviously, what's being changed and how, how that may affect the price and or, you know, the timeliness, whether it's going to extend the, you know, the job out. Um, 
types of change orders. Again, I've got some, I'm sure you probably all do as well, some contractor clients that are fantastic. I mean, they, you know, they've got daily logs, you know, um, you know, they, you know, I, I'll say, you know, what happened on January 18th, they go their daily logs and we did X, Y, and Z. We have these discussions, um, you know, with, with an owner about, you know, construction that was going on. Um, and I've got some that, you know, one, they don't do written change orders, or if they do, it's, you know, it's on the back of a napkin somewhere in some folder, you know, or something like that. So, uh, again, they can come in all shapes and sizes. Right here's a sample provision. I've tried to, um, from, a, a, I guess, a high level, just, you know, basically state it should be in writing, but also the back half of that, um, it said that oral or unsigned change order shall be binding upon owner if owner fails to object in writing prior to substantial completion of the work performed in accordance with such oral or unsigned change order. And I think, you know, oral change orders, even if you've got one that says it has to be signed and in writing, and I had this used against me one time. Uh, it was a, probably about $150,000 loss. It was actually an arbitration. And one of the big issues was some flooring that was put in. It was, you know, it was one of the larger ticket items, twenty, thirty thousand dollar flooring adjustment, and uh, my clients put the upgraded flooring in. And well, their response was, "Well, there's no change order for that. We didn't sign and agree to it. Therefore, we shouldn't have to pay it." Um, and so, these are some of the cases that I pulled. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that um, you know the court's not going to let, in this case, an owner sit there and watch a twenty thousand dollar hardwood flooring installation go down and just stand by and then try to take the position later date, we didn't sign a, a change order for it. So even though change order should be in writing, I think there's some protection there. Again, very fact specific analysis, uh, but um, you know, there's, there's some case law out there that's gonna protect you know, the contractor, for example, in that situation. Uh, you know, a lot of contracts will have warranty provisions in them. Uh, you know, everybody's familiar with, you know, the 12-month, you know, new home warranty, whatever the case may be. Uh, obviously, warranty, you know, language specifies exactly what the builder must do and what the buyer should expect. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of clients that come in and, you know, you know my 12-month warranty provision is running out and, you know, we need to do something. And, um, you know, most more times than not, they've already provided notice under, you know, the contract of, of, of you know, things that they've alleged with the house and so on and so forth. And so, uh, you know, I, obviously I think they're protected on that front. Um, there is some case law that talks about this. This is a case from 2008. Um, you know, it really just talks about any time that a contractor enters into an agreement to construct a house, for example, that there's an implied duty or warranty of workmanship that goes along with that. So. Not only is there an express warranty, but you got the applied duty, applied warranty of workmanship that goes along. Uh, you know, there's negligence claims uh, that can be brought. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Um, these are just basic statutes of limitation. Breach contract, six years. Damage to real property, three years. You know, if you've got a licensing issue, for example, you know, that's a one-year uh, statute of limitation on the TCPA, obviously. I very seldom, I, you know, I... I you know, there's case law out there talking about the gravamen complaint where it's breach of contract, damage to real property, so on and so forth. I don't even try to test that. I mean, you know, if somebody's coming in, if I don't have a TCPA claim, I mean, I typically calendar it as three years from when the date of the contract was executed, even though it could even extend by that. So I, I think, you know, probably the three-year statute of limitation is, you know, again, if you don't have a TCPA claim, what you really need to focus on. Statute of repose. Again, probably all in here are familiar with this. It's uh, four years from the substantial date of completion. I actually tried a case on this um, about seven years ago. I had a client that um, had a very nice house, built a detached three-car garage, and I think he had two Porsches in that detached three-car garage, a, a couple a Harley Davidson. So he had some nice, you know, vehicles. Um, well. You know, probably, at least up where I live and probably, you know, uh, East Tennessee in general, everything you build is built into the earth in some form or fashion, a hill or something. Well, this particular contractor built this detached three-car garage um, up against an embankment, and he built it with hollow masonry block. Um, and so four years and one month to the day, you know, four years and one month, 
One month after the statute of repose passed, that whole back wall collapsed um, on those vehicles, uh, tremendous amount of damage. Uh, of course, we filed a complaint, um, got popped with a motion to dismiss out of the gate, uh, got past that. There's obviously a caveat here that talks about, you know, fraud as an exception to the statute of repose. Um, and we actually tried that case and the judge, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but you know, his analysis was, you know, contract is a set of promises. Contract, it actually had in their language that it was supposed to, the back, you know, the, the walls of that uh, garage were supposed to be reinforced with concrete and steel. Um, and of course it was hollow. And so, won the case, he got, he was an unlicensed contractor and on top of that too, he got popped with some punitive damages, peeled it up to the Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals pretty much affirmed the, uh, trial court's uh, decision um, as well on that. By the way, can, can I do a quick trivia question? Sure. Every, he's mentioned AIA contracts. Here's my trivia question for you. Have the standard AIA contracts ever had a one-year warranty provision? Nobody wants to touch that. I've seen this. I believe the answer technically is no, that it's not actually in there. There's wording in it that implies it, but it's actually not in there. I, I may have read an article one time talking about the only reason I even. Yeah, there's, there's a well known article called The Myth of the One Year AIA Warranty. You ought to look it up one time. What AIA contracts have is a one year open quote, correction period, close quote. Mm. There's actually language in the A201 that says this is not a warranty. Mm. So, uh, Interesting. Yeah. I'm kind of of the opinion that because of the prevalence of the AIA and that, that's generated this myth of the one year warranty, and that's the only warranty period that anyone even thinks about. So most residential people say, well, I'm, that's all they think they, they have to give me is a one year. Yeah. Uh, and the, that's not necessarily true. And the tie in to the warranty, why it's very important for warranties, is if you look at the AIA commentaries, the reason they wrote their contracts that way is they're used in all 50 states. And they didn't want to come in and say what a warranty is, where states' laws can be different. In general, they would say that a warranty extends to the limitations or repose, mm -hmm. which is, that's why it ties mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. warranty. That's a, that gets litigated. And, and I read a case just the other day that was talking about how they can use warranty periods shorter than the limitations period in order to minimize the limitations periods and make them smaller. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty clever. Mm -hmm. This makes me think by getting back to these football coaches, college football coaches. You know, they're always talking about uh, they don't have a contract yet. They're just working under a memorandum of understanding. <laughs> <laughs> IDBs. And almost every IDB project you'll ever see has a memorandum of understanding. Of course, it's in a notebook about this thick. It's got a thousand documents in it, but it is an MOU. Wow. Um, insurance, a lot of times you'll see insurance provisions. Uh, you know, contractors a lot of times will have the you know, CJL policies. Um, you know, that's prevent third party claims for bodily injury and property damage. Uh, you know, I've run into this situation a lot and I'm not an insurance lawyer, so it's always frustrating to me, but a lot of times when I think, you know, a contractor has a particular type of insurance, you know, you know, it, 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 I can never, there's always some exclusion in the insurance policy, uh, you know, and I was looking through some stuff for this presentation and it, it's like, there's a ton of articles. Uh, I'm licensed in North Carolina as well and I was reading some stuff over there about, you know, whether uh, a construction defect uh, falls is considered uh, an occurrence under the CGL policy, they have to cover it. So a lot of times I get in these situations where, you know, where I'll have, uh, you know, a contractor that I've sued and then, you know, there's always some reservations of rights defense, you know, that I'm hearing from the other attorney as well and, you know, they may not have to pay or, you know, whatever the case may be. So. Um, you know, maybe something to look into if you're an owner, you know, see if there's some sort of faulty workmanship endorsement that goes along with that CGL policy. Um, obviously workers' comp insurance. Um, 
builder's risk insurance, that's obviously something the notary can get, um, you know, it's designed to provide construction sites against theft, vandalism, and natural disaster. I, I don't know if it's just me or it's Upper East Tennessee Justice. I'm not really sure, but I'm practicing for 20 years in the past probably three years, I've had two houses burned down during, uh, Gatlinburg. yeah, <laughs> I've had two houses burned down during the middle of property disputes. Uh, you know, one uh, uh, was it, it's going on, it's a lakefront property up in Johnson County. Um, it was a contractor dispute uh, and there was a storm that night. There was no other damage to any of the surrounding houses, but miraculously, my client's house burned down. Um, they had builder's risk insurance, so they were able to recoup that, rebuild their house, and they're, they're kind of you know, caught back up to where they were. Another situation, it was, wasn't a construction case, it was a property dispute, and um, it was a situation, there was no insurance on this, but it's an interesting story that you know, part of the, uh, there was a dispute between heirs uh, on some property, and you know, the way the settlement agreement was structured, you know, if we could, if we could repay them back by selling this particular property, then it was gonna trigger some other things in the settlement agreement. Well, they had a closing scheduled, like on a Thursday, for example. The house burnt down on a Wednesday night. Um, and so, luckily, you know, the folks that wanted the, the, the property actually didn't care about the house. It was kind of dilapidated, but I think it was pretty clear that that house burnt down because these other people didn't want these other provisions in the settlement agreement to trigger and to go into effect. But uh, I don't know if I'm unlucky or I need to buy a lottery ticket, I'm not sure. but. Uh, it's happened to me twice, again, in a fairly short period of time over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, again, sample provisions, um, you know, you guys can read those uh, as far as that, you know, what to be included in the, in the contract itself. And you, and you can go more detail with these, obviously. These are, again, very basic provisions. Uh, types of default, um, you know, there's, your contract should have, uh, obviously, some default language in here. Um, you know, the typical types that I see are, you know, non-payment workmanship issues. Obviously, we're all familiar with the material breach doctrine. You know, if the other party breaches and is substantial, it leaves the other party from performing under the contract. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and you guys, again, uh, I'm preaching the choir on this, just the right to cure. There's actually a statute for commercial projects. It really, uh, I think it's defined as just commercial projects, although, I, you know, you can use it as a guidepost for residential projects. Uh, but there's a bunch of case law that have extended the right to cure, um, you know, for residential projects as well. Um, I actually kind of used this. I, I had a, this is a small case, but I had a hardwood flooring installer that was probably a $25,000 job. And, you know, they claimed some defects and some other things. And he wanted to go back out, inspect, and try to fix it and do whatever he could. They, they just shut him down. They didn't respond to texts. The owners didn't. They didn't allow him to go in, inspect, try to make changes. We get the mediation. I started pointing out the case law on this. And we, you got a pretty, pretty decent uh, uh, resolution for uh, you know, the client in that respect. So again, something to keep in the back of your mind. There is a right to cure. What that, I, I tried to analyze and review cases on this about how much of a right to cure. I don't know if you guys have any experience on that. I think it, I, I can't find a bright line test, especially in the residential context. I think it really just depends upon, you know, what, what are you trying to cure? Uh, I've got a client that's got water in the foundation right now and some of those issues that are going on. So I think that probably would be a shorter time period than some other things where it's just more cosmetic. Uh, but again, I haven't been able to find a bright line test as far as how much cure you have to give them, how much opportunities you have. With the foundation issue, we've allowed him to come out. He didn't fix it the first time. Then he wanted to pour, fill up the foundation with concrete or something or another, the basement with concrete, like that was going to remediate the water issue. Uh, and that didn't even comport with anything that my experts were saying. So uh, again, uh, it, just something to keep in the back of your mind. I did have to look at recently and you do as on behalf of the owner give the notice remember the construction defect notice statute mm -hmm. does not apply mm -hmm. to residential construction right. a lot of people don't know that right. so it's not under that statute you do have to give notice but what you get back as to the cure and the timing 
it can't just be, yeah, we can fix this for five grand and we'll get back to you when we might be able to do that. Right. It's got to be something more like specific that, than that. Yeah. Then you can just say, okay, sayonara. I got somebody else going right. to fix it. But it, it does, you have to kind of fairly meet the substance of the issue. Right. With your does it kind of follow the, you know, the commercial uh, statute? Sort of. <laughs> okay. It depends. <laughs> and I really do think it is. And there's a couple of cases out there because I have looked at this because mm -hmm. I regularly have residential clients that come mm -hmm. and say, no, I've got, I don't trust this person whatsoever. They, right. They've done such a bad job. My expectations are so low. I would never allow them to come touch my house ever again. Please don't tell me I have to do this. And there's some cases out there that kind of say, well, if, you, if yeah. there's evidence, right. you've completely lost all confidence. Confidence, so correct. No yeah. To do that. But it's a gamble. You're it is. In the hands of the court. You right. Know, make that decision. So That's it's a the jack very leg, specific. The jack leg defense. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's a jack leg. <laughs> And that's a, the conundrum I always run into because, you know, I, I've, I know the cases you're talking about and, you know, I had that issue come up with the foundation or the, the water issue. And it's like, how much notice, how many opportunities do I got to give them to come out and, and fix this issue? And, you know, again, we got to the point where he was just, you know, his concrete guy told him something that was so far out in left field compared to what our structural expert had said. That at that point, we were just like, okay, I think we have enough just to go ahead and terminate and, you know, move on. So... On the, but on the commercial um, statute, I've, I recently got a case dismissed on that exact statute. Um, they, they, they actually kind of gave us kind of a half notice, but they actually did let us go out and kind of look at it. They talked about it, sent some photos, and our folks said, well, we can, we can fix it. We don't have to replace it. They said, no, never mind. They went ahead and fixed it themselves. Oh, let's see. We turned around and said, well, the statute says you had to give us written notice and we had to go through this whole dance of 30 days and 10 days and reject, you know, mm -hmm. offer and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you have to, I said you had to, you have to assert that as part of your claim that you've met that. And the court, the court granted our motion, dismissed it. Um, because, because at that point, you know, it's not just delaying the inevitable. Mm -hmm. You can't go back and do the dance. And that was my argument. It was like, we can never go back and conduct our statutory, it actually says assessment, not inspection, assessment of the damages. So you can never meet your obligation to give us pre suit notice under mm -hmm. the statute. And, That's interesting. And, and the other attorney in that case was like, well, no one ever uses this. Everybody knows <laughs> it. <laughs> so a, I, I've actually filed two motions on it this year, and I think I'm going to win the second one, too. Um, and it was the second one, someone you guys know very well, uh, said, well, Paul, no one uses this. I said, well, I'm using it because uh, I have to. So it's it, a very was the dismissal on the, uh, the, the pleading requirement that it didn't assert it or just the, the, it, the steps wasn't followed well, or both? The way that I did it was they, they talked about the notice in the case. And I did a Rule 12 uh, motion. It wasn't a summary judgment. And I said, I said the notice that they talked about in the case I mean, in their complaint, doesn't comply with the statute. So, and then I say that they had to affirmatively allege that they've complied with the statute. Um, and then they also said, we fixed it now, and we can't, you know, because they refused to, to do it. And I said, they've, they've actually alleged that it's no longer capable of being complied with. Hmm. And Interesting. It says it's dismissed, but then it, doesn't it say that you can go and, no, it and says, it says a baby. It says a baby. And that's what they argue is abated, but then there's great case law that abate means, it means actually worse than dismiss, to act like it, to basically to, to demolish it as, as if it never existed. Um, and so they can't go back and fix it. You know? So I think it's only effective if they've actually, if the owner has kind of taken the unwise step of correcting the stuff and altering it, and you can't go back and do the dance. And the statute is black and white. That's right. my argument. Is yeah. I don't care if you say that we had notice of it or we kind of mm -hmm. knew about it. We were kind of involved. In, in my other one, we, we kind of knew about it, but we didn't know that they were pointing the gun at us as we were talking, talking through the issues with them. And now my argument is, well, you should have given us the statutory notice because they would have turned that in. You know, they'd have hired counsel. We would have looked at it better 
before you guys changed it all. And Send me your stuff on abatement. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is that an issue? They could not have been moving to the point of stuff. In the first one, there's nothing they can do. Now, so they, can they are going to try. Okay. They, they barked about trying, but they're not going to do it. They couldn't say that. She may, she may prove me wrong, uh, but I don't, I don't see it. Uh, I mean, the, the, second one, the, the second one is a lot closer, um, but I think there's, I, I like my chances. I've got a black and white statute. Hmm. Wow. Does that require substantial compliance with it, or is it strict? Does it say in the statute? No, I just don't it doesn't say it. It doesn't say. Um, the case also substantial. I think it's substantial. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no that, there's only know. there's only one case on it, and the case actually just reversed trial court because it was a commercial. I mean, it was a residential case. Yeah, which it did. But but the case the case says the statute is clear and unambiguous, and it requires. And then it says, but. Mm -hmm. It's only in commercial, not residential. So there's one case in Tennessee on that whole statute. Wow. Yeah. That's the first time wow. I've ever heard a court rule that a statute was clear and unambiguous. It says it. it, says it. Wow. So. Is the other party going to appeal that, you think, or is it already past that point? Uh, well, they, um, yeah, no, I think they're going to try to. It was, it's Rule 12, so it's without prejudice. So they, oh, okay, they're, they're going to go ahead. They're, they may try to fix it, but I, don't, I can't yeah. see. If they've already fixed the property. How are they going to fix it? Yeah. Because, because I told them, I said, I said, we're going to do this dance again. If you refile it, we're going to. Because they did send me a notice after, after it was dismissed. And I told them, I said, that doesn't fix it. I think I'm out of time, but there's just a couple other things uh, in here, other provisions. Uh, obviously, arbitration. Uh, are you guys. I'm just curious. Prefer arbitration provisions for residential projects. I, you know, I, I, I think there's pros and cons to it. I, mean, I think you know, know your, uh, know your courts, uh, your judges. I'm, I'm fine trying. You know, I one every time I ever do a jury trial and construction case, but fine with bench trials up there. And obviously, um, you know, what I don't like about the ADR provisions, and I got hammered on this. Uh, you know, they've got those fast track procedures. And is it a construction? Is it a hundred thousand two party? Is that what it's it is? A AAA rule. Right, right. And that goes under the fast track procedure. Right, and I, I'm sure you guys have probably tried these things under the fast track. I, I got introduced to it in a commercial case last year and got hammered on it that, you know, and he, opposing, he was counsel up in D.C., he was representing a uniform supplier, a nationwide uniform supplier. I had a car dealership client, and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a uniform dispute, and uh, he intentionally pled it for like $74,999, you know, and. Next thing I knew, we had the, you know, <laughs> we had the telephone conference, you know, with you know, the arbitrator, and he's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to set this for trial in 30 days. <laughs> I'm just like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, you're, you're obviously just an exchange of documents is all you get. No, no really written discovery, no depositions. It's almost kind of, you know, trying to case like in general sessions court, but, it, you know, it's, it's a bigger lick. You know, if you got a smaller, even a medium-sized client, you know, you, you can't, you know, a $75,000, $100,000 hit, that, that, that's substantial. And you, the problem is that having served on fast-track arbitrations as arbitrator, all this has happened to you or not, I bet it has. Lawyers go in and they don't get half their case done the first day. Right, yeah. And then it goes over to the regular track rules, which is, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a warning if you're going to do a fast track. You better get done in that day. Otherwise, you're going to default to the regular track rules and have to pay money and some mm -hmm. of us more. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're fine with that. Well, that's all I had. I, I appreciate everybody's indulgence. I know it was kind of a basic contract review, but I appreciate it. So thank you.